Hello and good afternoon. I'm Chris Wolfort, the Associate Director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you today today's presentation by Jose Antonio Ocampo, the voice of developing countries and economic decision making. This event is made possible by the class of 1950 and is offered in support of the Dartmouth Center's forum theme, Speak Out, Listen Up. I would like to thank the members of the class of 1950, several of whom are with us this afternoon, for their generosity in endowing the class of 1950 Senior Foreign Affairs Fellowship. This gift allows the Dickey Center to bring in each year at least one, and sometimes two, distinguished foreign affairs scholars or practitioners to share their expertise with the Dartmouth community. The class of 1950 fellow is in residence for several days or more, gives a public presentation on an issue of global importance, and meets with classes, student groups, and faculty during their stay. The fellowship was given by the class of 1950 to the Dickey Center in recognition of the impact of Dartmouth's 12th president, John Sloan Dickey, and the impact he had on their Dartmouth years and upon their understanding of international issues. This class was the first to experience four years of the Dickey presidency, and it was to their class on convocation in 1946 that Dickey made his most well-known and oft-quoted claim that the world's troubles are your troubles, that the world's worst troubles come from men, and there is nothing wrong with the world that better human beings cannot fix. What is less well-known is that Dickey's next convocation address in 1947 was entitled an introduction to humility. Dickey referred to humility as, quote, the surest solvent known for those two most persistent enemies of the educated, pride and prejudice. Indeed, in a time when American power was on the rise, Dickey recognized that humility would be essential for both recognizing the extent of our commitments in and to the world, as well as for being an effective um, uh, advocate for our efforts to address the world's problems. We need not only act in the world, we need to be humble enough to recognize that we know not everything and that we need to listen. As today's lecture will no doubt touch upon, being heard requires someone willing to listen to you. It is not sufficient merely to speak up. By offering this talk, which focuses on the challenge of being heard, we hope to continue the Dartmouth Center's forum discussion on the, effective, on the challenges of effective communication embodied in this year's theme, Speak Out, Listen Up. Our speaker this afternoon is an excellent candidate for the class of 1950 Senior Foreign Affairs Fellowship, being both a distinguished scholar and a practitioner. Jose Antonio Campo hails from Colombia, both the country and the university, where he is currently professor in the professional practice of international and public affairs. He teaches in the Graduate Program of Sustainable, Sustainable Development and is a member of Columbia University's Committee on Global Thought. His studies included economics and sociology as an undergraduate at the University of Notre Dame, and he earned a PhD in economics at Yale. He has held academic positions at Cambridge University, where he was a professor in the Advanced Program on Rethinking Development Economics, and at the University of the Andes and at the Univer National University of Columbia, where he taught economics and economic history, respectively. He has held fellowships previously at Oxford and Yale. Professor Ocampo has also served in a variety of positions in the government of Colombia and at the United Nations. In Colombia, he served as Minister of Finance and Public Credit, Chairman of the Board of the Central Bank of Colombia, Minister of Planning, Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, to just name some of his portfolios. At the UN, he served most notably as the United Nations Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, and as Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Our guest writes on macroeconomic policy and theory, economic development, international trade, and economic history. His recent publications include Stability with Growth, Macroeconomics, Liberalization and Development, which he co-authored with Joseph Stieglitz, Sherry Spiegel, Ricardo French Davis, and Deepak Nayar. This came out in Oxford University Press in 2006. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jose Ocampo. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I'm, I'm really happy to be back 
at the Dartmouth at the Dickey Center. And uh, I appreciate the, uh, this uh, support of the class of 1950 that allows me to be uh, with you today. Um, uh, as part of this sequence of, of, the, of this year, um, uh, we discussed with the director of the Dickey Center what uh, should be a topic for me to, to reflect upon. And, uh, and finally, come to this issue of you know, uh, how you know, developing countries uh, relate to international uh, institutions. Uh, and of course, more in the economic uh, area, uh, uh, we could, of course, try to think of the political area, which is not my area, my field of expertise. Uh, so I, 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 I can hardly do, uh, do anything in that area. But let me say that economic, I, I mean in a very broad sense, um, uh, meaning also uh, social issues uh, that are at the center of, you know, particularly of the UN agencies, uh, and also environmental issues, which are, uh, as we know, particularly in the case of climate change, uh, intrinsically linked uh, with the ec economic issues. So uh, I, I'll use this economic decision making really in the broad sense to reflect uh, to the um, you know, economic, social, and environmental agenda uh, that is uh, dealt with by international uh, institutions. I'm going to divide my, my talk in, uh, in three broad parts. I'll, I'll start by, by reflecting a bit on the, uh, on the nature of the concept of development in, the inter in international cooperation, uh, which has uh, several, uh, uh, I think, features that are not uh, uh, always well understood. Then I, I go into the issues of the governance structures and the voice of developing countries and end up with the, you know, some reflections on how to make uh, a, an international economic uh, architecture, let's say, uh, more inclusive uh, of the needs of developing countries. So let me start then by, by the concept uh, of what is meant by development. So perhaps it is um, uh, it's useful to start by, by reflecting uh, you know, on the four major objectives of international cooperation uh, as uh, laid down in uh, probably the most, uh, one of the most magnificent uh, pieces of uh, international agreement, which is the preamble to the UN Charter, okay? um, uh, which actually lays out these four major objectives. Peace, which was natural, you know, since the institution had been created. Uh, at the end of a war, uh, of the Second uh, World War. Human rights, uh, which came to, uh, to have a, a level of uh, international cooperation uh, unseen before the creation of the United Nations. Respect for international law uh, and development. And this interestingly how development was defined in the UN Charter. So these are the in the preamble of the UN Charter, it, it says that, you know, one, the determination uh, to promote social progress and better standards of living in larger freedom. So there was this association of development with freedom, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, as you know, comes actually from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, from the, his four freedom speech and the influence in which, uh, you know, that he had on the, uh, on the conception of the United Nations, and of course, the particular uh, uh, influence that, that his wife had in, uh, in, in developing the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So there is actually, a, you know, the concept of freedom, then of rights, which is intrinsically right, you know, tied with freedom, uh, came uh, with the concept of development in the UN Charter. Now, in the practice, uh, development uh, really has uh, come to mean uh, uh, two different things uh, in, the, in the UN. The second one, uh, which is what I call development of societies, uh, is uh, that the one that is uh, you know, most directly related to the, uh, to the concept of the UN Charter. And it has come through, through a variety of um, norms, standards, uh, legal provisions, uh, you, know, you know, written in international treaties, et cetera, uh, that uh, uh, broadly speaking uh, can be said to, to be related in the last two decades 
to the UN summits and conferences, but also to the history of the International Labor Organization, UNICEF, and many of the uh, major international agencies. But it has also meant to be cooperation with developing countries in particular. Um, uh, and sometimes uh, the, the word development uh, is really meant to be exclusively that. Uh, but uh, we should never forget that it also meant, uh, 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 and particularly it was meant to be in the UN Charter, uh, this thing that I call the development of societies. So the standards for a better uh, life in larger freedom, uh, to use the words of the, of the Charter. So more concretely, uh, I will uh, argue, I have been arguing, uh, you know, in my reflections of my UN dates, let's say my UN years actually, because it was almost a decade of, <laughs> of my life, uh, you know, trying to understand what is that, uh, that international cooperation does uh, in the area of development. And I've come to, to the, uh, conceive uh, that cooperation in three broad areas. The first one is managing interdependence. Um, and then we can think of, of this, um, uh, for instance, uh, as being at the center, for instance, of the uh, management of international economy during the global financial crisis. That's interdependence, right? The independence generated by financial markets. But also in the fight against climate change, which is also an issue of, uh, uh, of interdependence uh, among, uh, among countries. Or you can think of many other things, for instance, trade rules. That's a, also an area of interdependence, you know, because we depend on our uh, trading uh, relations. So this is a, a very, uh, you know, very central issue of international cooperation. But the second is the one that uh, more closely relates to the, uh, to the UN Charter, uh, which is uh, uh, this fostering of development of societies or, uh, of, uh, or as, you know, we could think of it as building gradually a concept of global citizenship so that we all belong to humanity, to a one humanity, uh, and that that humanity has certain uh, rules, standards, that we want to apply to all. And in this area, the UN has been quite influential. When you think of, um, I mean, uh, uh, the issue of gender equality. Gender equality is very much, you know, uh, the result of the, you know, the influence of the United Nations. Uh, you know, the Beijing summit on, uh, on women, uh, but also the, pre uh, the, uh, the one that preceded it uh, 10 years before, the one in Mexico, are landmarks in the fight uh, for gender equality. But in recent years, for instance, uh, the rise of indigenous peoples uh, has been at the center of the, of the UN. And even before that, uh, you can think of the, uh, the work of the International Labor Organization uh, since the end of the First World War, because it was one of the first uh, agencies to be created. Uh, which has, uh, you know, developed, you know, standards of uh, uh, freedom of association of workers, the right for collective uh, um, uh, negotiation uh, of workers, uh, but also the um, elimination of, uh, of child labor. I mean, to mention just a, a huge set of standards that belong to this uh, broad concept that I call building global citizenship of, of a source. And the third, which is the one that relates more uh, to the um, developing countries in particular, is uh, correcting the asymmetries that characterize the world economic system, okay? And, uh, and uh, the last two, you know, you can think of is uh, the relate to the quality of citizens on the one hand and the quality of nations, okay? Now, it's interesting that this uh, typology of uh, forms of cooperation actually coincides with history. When you think of the first forms of cooperation that um, existed, uh, you know, prior to the First World War, uh, that led to the creation of, of the first uh, international framework for cooperation, the League of Nations uh, and the International Labor Organization, which was created with it um, in, in the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, you know, going back to the 19th century, uh, it is really in the area of interdependence that cooperation lied. Uh, it was in the, um, 
for instance, in uh, rules on navigation, which were very important, uh, trade treaties, uh, but also the, uh, the first actions of, uh, against communicable diseases uh, that led to the creation of some uh, agencies, for instance, the Pan American Health Organization, uh, predates the, the First World War. It was one of the first international organizations. It was totally associated to, the, to this issue of communicable diseases uh, in the Americas. The First World War um, and, and the disaster that it generated uh, led to the creation of the League of Nations, and very, but very importantly also to the International Labor Organization. It was then considered in the Treaty of Versailles that, uh, that peace was also uh, a good, harmonious uh, labor relations, which at the time, of course, was uh, quite, quite an important issue. Um, uh, as we know, the, uh, the Russian Revolution had just started. Germany was in turmoil in the midst of a revolution uh, with the rise also of the, uh, you know, the fall of the monarchy and the rise of the uh, social democratic movement. And in general, the, you know, the, uh, this issue of the uh, labor relations uh, uh, as an element of peace was quite at the center of international cooperation. But there were also many other forms of cooperation uh, that developed in the areas of education and health around the League of Nations. Uh, so, the, in, in a sense, the, uh, the second form of cooperation uh, was really born out of the First World War. But the third one uh, is really the, um, the result of the Second World War, uh, and particularly uh, all the decision uh, to uh, eliminate uh, coloni uh, uh, colonialism in the world. So, the result of the fight against colonialism uh, in which the United States was actually one of the major actors, uh, particularly because, of course, uh, uh, the major colonial empires were European, although the U.S. had its own uh, dependencies, dependent countries, uh, you know, uh, Philippines, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, you know, were, uh, and, and, and in some extent, in the case of Puerto Rico, it's an unsettled relation uh, with the United States. But anyway, the uh, the colonial empires were mainly uh, a, a European affair. And, uh, and the decision to eliminate colonialism uh, was, uh, which was of course a gradual one, but took place uh, in the decades after the Second World War, uh, meant that a large part of the world uh, uh, became independent. Uh, uh, that is what we call developing countries. In fact, the only uh, part of the developing world uh, that uh, was really independent on a uh, large scale was Latin America, uh, which had become independent uh, two centuries ago, actually, um, as a result of a process that is, uh, will be too long to try to, to, to explain today. Uh, but, uh, uh, but that was the only you know, really independent part of the developing world. And that's why actually Latin America plays such an important role uh, in the origins of the United Nations, because it was a major block of developing countries in the UN and also in the creation of the Bretton Woods Institution. Now, how does uh, uh, the international system, uh, how has it managed uh, the particular issues of developing countries? Uh, I will argue that, you know, it, uh, I will mention three basic concepts that uh, come very repeatedly uh, in the UN debates, uh, but also in the debates of the Bretton Woods Institution. By the way, the Bretton Woods Institutions, created, of course, at Bretton Woods, uh, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, uh, had been created in 1944. I mean, that is one year before the UN, uh, but, the, um, but they were convened in the names of the United Nations before they were created, uh, meaning really by the United Nations, the allies, okay? So that is uh, and the, uh, the birth of a new order uh, which will come out of the, uh, of the allies uh, uh, during the Second World War. And so that the, the meeting uh, of Bretton Woods that created uh, the, United, uh, the, uh, the, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank uh, was called in the names of the United Nations uh, before the uh, formal United Nations uh, were created uh, one year later in San Francisco. Um, now, so the, the three concepts are, are quite interesting and, and, and in a sense, um, 
Uh, we'll come back uh, perhaps in some of my uh, discussions uh, uh, later on, uh, but I wanted to mention them uh, as, as central to the, uh, to the debates on development. The first one uh, is the, uh, the principle that was developed uh, for uh, trade, uh, which is the concept of a special and differential treatment. So the, uh, in the 1960s, as a result of the debates uh, on the role of, of the position of developing countries in the international trading system, and uh, how you know, they continue to be dependent on commodities, and they had been you know, little, uh, very little successful in, uh, in developing manufacturing exports. Uh, the, uh, there was a decision to create uh, an asymmetric uh, rule for developing countries in the uh, international trading system, which was incorporated in the trading agreement of the time, which was GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And that was said, well, you have uh, the, uh, the, the uh, developing countries have a, a possibility of being treated differently uh, by industrial countries. And developing countries could treat among themselves also uh, with some flexibility in the rules. That's what was called special and differential treatment. The second, uh, which I find even more interestingly uh, uh, for today's reality, uh, uh, is the concept that was coined uh, in, the, uh, in the Earth Summit of Rio de Janeiro uh, in 1992, um, which actually is going to have a major event next year, also in Rio de Janeiro, the uh, Rio Plus 20, as it's called in the, U in the UN processes, uh, which is, uh, of course, the, uh, in a sense, the, the birth or the major forms of international cooperation in the environmental field. Uh, the three major uh, in environmental conventions, the Climate Change Convention, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and the Convention of Desertification uh, were born uh, out of, the, of that uh, major uh, meeting in Rio you know, in 1992. And then the, the concept uh, that was developed, um, one of the basic principles of the Rio Declaration was this principle that, you know, of common but differentiated responsibility. That is, all nations have a common responsibility, but there is a differentiation in the responsibility of industrial versus developing countries. And, and this, you know, the, what the discussions that are going on now on climate change have very much this uh, issue at the center of the negotiation processes uh, that are taking place. And the third concept uh, came actually uh, out of the uh, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, uh, is the concept of, of the policy space. The, the concept here is that uh, the, the you know, uh, developing countries are more constrained uh, in what they, you know, the uh, economic policies that they can undertake. They are constrained by availability of resources, uh, by the fact that they are technological followers and not technological leaders, um, and by the fact that they have uh, a, 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 a great availability of labor, but labor is not allowed to move freely internationally as opposed to capital, uh, so that you know, the policy space that they have is more limited. So one of the major things uh, in, the, in, in the debates has, in, has been how to increase the policy space that developing countries have in the international system. With that framework, let, let me go into analyzing some of the major issues associated to the governance structures and the role that developing countries play in those governance structures. Now, the basic structure uh, of, the, uh, of, inter of the international system is, uh, is the UN system in the broad sense. As it was conceived uh, uh, at the end of the Second World War, it will have the, uh, the United Nations organization uh, which is actually a system uh, of agencies. Uh, we actually divide in the jargon of the United Nations uh, in, in different, you know, um, you know we, we recognize the secretariat, the UN secretariat, that is, the, let's say, the domain of the UN secretary general at the center of the system. Then we have the funds and programs which are closer to that secretariat and that include um, a, a UNICEF, the United Nations Development Program, the World Food Program, et cetera, et cetera, you know, are organizations uh, 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 for which uh, the heads of the organization 
are elected in the UN General Assembly, uh, and the uh, governing bodies at the end are uh, the, uh, uh, the General Assembly and the Economic and Social Council of the UN. Okay? And then we have the specialized agencies. The specialized agencies have the characteristic that they are um, a, a more autonomous in the sense that they have their own governing bodies, which are generally, generally meetings of ministers uh, of different character, which actually elect their heads. So the heads are not elected by the UN General Assembly. Now, these include the organizations such as UNESCO, or World Health Organization, or the International Labor Organization, etc., and include, and very importantly, the Bretton Woods institutions, include the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, which are also UN is, uh, parts of the UN system. Uh, are, they are not very peculiarly generally conceived as that, and they don't themselves conceive themselves always as that. Uh, uh, the one way I, 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 I sometimes uh, explain this is that you know uh, ILO or uh, or WHO uh, use the, the blue flag. The IMF and the World Bank don't. Okay, I think it's a basic difference. You know, they have their own flags. They don't. They don't use the blue color. <laughs> uh, they try to become a bit, but they are part of the UN system in the broad sense of the term, and they have. And they were created by this uh, uh, United Nations uh, meeting in Bretton Woods. An additional organization that was also conceived as being in the, having that character was the International Trade Organization, which was also approved uh, in 1948 in the in the meeting in Havana, uh, but was never ratified by U.S. Congress, so it never came into being. Okay, uh, and only one part of the treaty, which is GATT. Uh, which had been approved one year before, became uh, the, uh, let's say, the trade rules of the international system. Okay? Uh, much later, in, uh, actually in 1994, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, was created, but very peculiarly, that's uh, one of the few major organizations uh, that is not part of the UN system. So the WTO was created outside the UN system, uh, which, of course, uh, brings uh, some problems that I don't have to explain today. Now, what is characteristic of this system is that you have a very decentralized structure. So it's almost like a government, uh, but a government in which there is no coordinator. <laughs> okay? So let's say in, the, in any government, let's say the U.S. government, you have you know, lots of secretaries uh, with their specific portfolios, the health, the labor, you know, the trade, et cetera, et cetera. But they are at the end coordinated by one person, the, the president. Uh, there is no, no such a thing at the, at the global level. So you have a lot of autonomous agency in a decentralized system, uh, which uh, sometimes, uh, for that reason, there is no true coordination because the UN Secretary General does not, is not given by the UN Charter the capacity to coordinate. Uh, it's really um, a, 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 an incoherent system in many ways. So there are views that are expressed by different uh, agencies that may not be coherent with those that are expressed by other agencies, and there is nothing uh, that can uh, help to, uh, to make that structure more coherent. Third is an international system. And by that, uh, uh, I mean a system in which the nation state continues to be the uh, building block. So it's not a transnational system. There is not, in that sense, a, a true global government. Uh, we have really a collection of national governments uh, that try to reach agreement. See, at a, as a transnational system, not even the European Union uh, has gone really all the way. There are some functions that have been given to the uh, European Commission, to the European Parliament, uh, in, the, in Europe, but most of the functions continue to be national in character. So Europe, Europe even Europe, is a, is a mix between uh, an international uh, cyst, uh, let's say organization and a transnational organization. But aside from that regional organization, let's say the world, the global system is really uh, international in the sense that you know, the nation state is still at the center of the system. Fourth 
it has large gaps. There is, a, there is an incomplete agenda. There are issues that are not even dealt with by international cooperation at all. I mean, a very important one is international migration. There is no true framework for cooperation in international migration. Uh, the only, uh, I mean, there is, of course, an international migration organization, which is outside the UN, but that organization has really been uh, associated with the uh, issue of, uh, uh, of managing, uh, you know, irregular flows of migrants. Uh, but there is no framework for cooperation on regular migration at the international level. There are some frameworks for, you know, irregular migration, some of which are, some of which are actually a more or less well-known treaties, for instance, the, the Treaty Against Trafficking Human Beings, uh, but not, uh, there is no uh, a, a agenda, the international organization is outside the agenda. And even, even, and very interestingly, even cooperation in financial area uh, is, is largely incomplete because there is no international organization, for instance, on, for the regulation of banks. Okay? Banking regulation is still a prerogative of national governments. Uh, even in the United States, I must say, even some uh, states have powers over regu regulation. But there is no such a thing as, uh, as in, you know, an international agency for banking regulation. There is also an incomplete set of institutions, even in areas that, um, you know, uh, where there is uh, some scope for cooperation. Uh, and in even more cases, there is uh, a huge asymmetry between, um, uh, between the agenda that is accepted by international community and the instruments that are given to international organizations to undertake that agenda. So that you, I mean, one thing, for instance, um, that you can think of is less thing of gender equality, okay? Um, and the, the, the Beijing Platform of Action uh, approved in, the, in 1995 in the, in the Beijing Summit on Women uh, is a is basic framework that is accepted more or less uh, in that area. There is nothing that uh, will, f you know, any agency that is capable of enforcing that agenda. So it remains totally at the discretion of nation states or national parliaments, whether, you know, for some, some of the legal provisions related to gender equality are adopted or not. And even the agencies that do uh, work on women do th them with very limited resources and are, of course, incapable uh, of trying to implement the agenda, which is an agenda that remains uh, fundamentally the responsibility of, nation, of nation states. Okay? So it's a very, uh, it's a system with lots of, uh, of gaps, let's say, in, the, in its design. And very importantly, uh, and finally, as a, as a fifth characteristic, uh, it's also a system that has a lot of regional organizations, but that is extremely uh, uh, uneven in the density. There are areas of the world where there are many regional organizations that uh, complement the global uh, organizations. Uh, actually, the Americas uh, and Europe may be the best example. Um, uh, Africa is rising as, uh, as a, a continent with uh, a lot of regional organizations. But there are, you know, but in the past it was not like that, and, uh, and there are large parts of the world where the, you know, there are very weak regional organizations. So we have a system uh, which is also uneven in the density of the regional organization. This is important for one issue that I will bring later on. Now, how does the voice of developing countries uh, work in that system? I will start by emphasizing uh, uh, what I call the original sin of the of post-war arrangements. The fact that they were they inherited a system with huge international inequalities born out of colonialism. So the international system basically inherited a world in which most of the world was actually uh, made of colonies. So they had a, a huge process, first of all, uh, of trying to reduce the, uh, first of all, to give political autonomy, an issue that is not fully uh, achieved today, uh, but also of trying to manage the inequalities that were inherent in that system. A large part of the development agenda, as I mentioned before, is associated to that fact. 
But aside from that, uh, which is a, 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 an issue that has been at the center for a long time, I will argue that the major issue today is uh, the tension uh, between the inclusiveness and legitimacy of the global organizations and the power structures. Now, how does that uh, work? Uh, I will argue that the uh, major problem in this regard is the, the tendency of major or most, the most powerful countries to really rely on the, the institutions that they control uh, and to reduce the power in the, that decentralized system uh, of those that they do not fully control or create new institutions that they control. What do, do I mean by that? I mean by that, for example, uh, that the uh, Bretton Woods institutions, uh, where the major countries have more control, are preferred over the United Nations. But even in some cases, not even the Bretton Woods institutions are, are, pref are acceptable, and the industrial countries create new institutions that they more fully control. For instance, the group of seven, okay? So, so in fact, there is a huge tension in the international system bet, uh, that in, and since it's a very decentralized structure uh, between the, uh, you know, the power, how power is exercised by major countries and the, uh, the way the system is designed, okay? And this is, uh, I would say, the, this is sometimes uh, posed as a question of effectiveness. Say all the international organizations are ineffective but they are ineffective in many occasions because they are not given the power, or the major countries don't work to, don't want to work through those organizations in order to to take decisions in uh, in those organizations. For example, you know, in the financial crisis, there was a decision to create the G20, the Group of 20, as the major framework for cooperation. You could think, you could have thought of not doing that but rather taking decisions in the IMF, which, uh, you know, you can say, and I have argued in many fora internationally, that most of the decisions of the Group of, of 20 could have been taken by the IMF. They were not taken in the IMF. They decided to create a different organization to take those decisions. Because I believe at the end, it's, so it's, it, they, I think they think they controlled, you know, the major countries controlled better those organizations where they don't feel that the other, like the IMF, uh, is, a re is as reliable. And the United Nations, is the United Nations ineffective uh, because um, uh, the, uh, it is inherently ineffective or is because it's not given the power to take decisions? In the areas where you know, decisions are taken in the United Nations, they are effective. In a, in a significant way, but in many areas they are not given the uh, capacity to. Now, how do decision makings work in those organizations and what is the role of the different actors? I would say there are, there are five, at least I can think of five different uh, decision making uh, structures. The first one is what I co I've come to call elite multilateralism, okay? Uh, which is a, a grouping of powerful countries that take decisions. So it's the group of seven, or group of eight now, is now the group of 20, is, and it's actually the bodies of financial regulation work like that. The Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, for example, the major uh, structure is part of that system. It's not, you know, it's not created by international treaty. It's actually created by a group of countries that control this uh, functioning. Now the Financial Stability Board, uh, uh, which was, uh, well, created in one version after the Asian crisis of 1997, but was also given now the power to coordinate financial regulation. That belongs to that category because it's not created again by a treaty, it's basically created by a grouping of powerful countries. The second is the organizations where countries have vetoes, powerful countries have vetoes. The UN Security Council uh, is the most uh, important one, but actually the IMF, 
which I didn't add to this list, is also uh, another one because the U.S. has veto power. It's the only, it's one country, the only country that has veto power in the in the IMF, basically because uh, uh, the IMF requires 80 per 85 percent uh, votes for uh, adopting certain decisions, and the U.S. has 18 percent uh, voting power. So the U.S. has the more than the minimum power, um, uh, and is capable for for that decision too. Uh, veto some decisions. I mean, one uh, interesting case actually is uh, is the issues of this international money that is uh, uh, issued by the IMF, which is called the Special Drawing Rights, a very bad name. Uh, uh, there was a 1997 decision uh, to issue a Special Drawing Rights. Now, it was not approved by U.S. Congress, so it never became effective until two years ago when it was finally approved by U.S. Congress. So that's a particular case in which the U.S. has veto power <laughs> over the uh, decisions of the IMF. The third model is the, the model of the Bretton Woods institutions, uh, which is based on, on two principles, weighted voting based on, uh, on quotas, so on the principle of one dollar, one vote, let's say, um, uh, but uh, also uh, on constituencies. So the countries that do not have enough power to uh, so it's more like a board of a private firm, you know, you don't have enough vote, uh, ownership, let's say, to, to elect a member of, uh, of the board. You have to, you know, form a constituency that can elect a member of the board. So that's, that's how most board members of the IMF are elected. They represent grouping of countries. Um, uh, and uh, let's say, for instance, my country, Colombia, is part of a constituency uh, which is headed by Brazil, which uh, another major member of that coalition is uh, Philippines. So it, it's not necessarily regional in character. So you, there's all sorts of arrangements. Uh, for instance, Canada uh, is elected uh, with the votes of, of the Caribbean countries and some others. So they represent also the Caribbean countries in the IMF board. The, th the fourth model is the UN model. Uh, which is, of course, equal voting power for countries. So it's like the U.S. Senate, right? Two senators per state. Okay, so this is one vote, one country, one state, you know, uh, two votes in the U in U.S. Senate, right? So it's a principle of equality of nations uh, made to, uh, you know, to at the center of the system. Uh, and, of course, the difference between the Bretton Woods and the U.N., and, and you go of course, to the ones above it, is the fact that in the United Nations, the developing countries have a lot of voice. They are uh, the overwhelming majority of the UN members. So that the, any decision uh, that is acceptable to developing countries will be uh, 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 approved in the UN, with the exception of the Security Council, which works on the different principle. Now, in the Bretton Woods institution, it doesn't happen like that. Until the reform that I will present uh, later on, uh, the industrial countries had 60% voting power in the IMF. Developing countries only 40%, so they have a minority share. So the, the, uh, and in terms of, of the board, there were 24 board members, out of which 13 were from industrial countries and, thir and 11 from developing countries. So the developing countries were outvoted any time the, you know, the industrial countries uh, want uh, in the IMF. And the same thing is true of the World Bank. And finally, we have the WTO model, which is a very interesting uh, model, the latest, uh, actually, uh, of all of them. <laughs> um, well, I guess it's with the exception of the G20 uh, on top, a, a, which was created on the basis of consensus. So the basic principle of WTO is that most decisions have been to approved by consensus, which you could interpret that as being the, uh, the, 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 point, the fact that any country has veto power, okay? So any country that says no can block a decision, okay? So it, it is, um, it, so it's one country, one vote with this capacity of everyone to have a veto. Well, it doesn't happen like that. So there is a very complex system of consensus building uh, that the uh, head of the uh, WTO calls a, a system of concentric circles 
but when you try to build consensus, and, but it has at the center at the, or at the top a, a, uh, a group a, uh, that meets into historically in uh, what's called the Green Room. Um, the Green Room was, it was, uh, it was it's named after, the, you know, for the fact that it actually was, a, you know, painted with green uh, in the WTO headquarters, but it was a before in GATT headquarters. Uh, and that uh, basically where the, the quad, as uh, it was called in trade negotiations, met and took decisions for GATT. The quad was made of the US, European Union, Japan, and Australia, no developing country. Now with time, that green room has expanded, and, and now the current uh, green room uh, also includes um, uh, China, India, and Brazil. So it has expanded group uh, of seven members, you know, three considered to be truly developed, uh, but in fact four because Australia is somehow categorized as not in that group, uh, and then you have three developing countries. Then you have a system uh, made up of a, a larger grouping of representatives of uh, different uh, or uh, UN, uh, excuse me, different groupings of, of you know, for different reasons, for instance, the, the ACP, which is, it means uh, Africa, uh, excuse me, Asia, Asia, Caribbean, Pacific, no, Africa, Caribbean, Caribbean Pacific, which is basically the former colonies of Europe um, that uh, have their own grouping. Uh, there is, uh, they have a lot of preferences in the European markets, and, and that's why, they, you know, they form a group. They have the group of least developed countries, they have now the group of the cotton producers of Africa, three cotton producers which are formed uh, against the, uh, the cotton subsidies of the U.S. Uh, they have the, uh, the, 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 group, the group of 20 uh, in the WTO, which is basically a group of, led by Brazil that fights for uh, agricultural liberalization. Before that, there was the Cairns group, in which I actually had the opportunity to participate, uh, which was the group of uh, of countries uh, develop and developing that were fighting for also for uh, more uh, trade liberalization in agriculture. Anyway, so they have this larger grouping of countries, and then you have at the at the bottom, of course, the structure of all the WTO members. Uh, so you have a you know a system of of, uh, of concentric circles that the the uh, manager, uh, the director general of WTO calls them. Now the fact is that the the really behind that there is really a system of unequal relations and we could add a lot of arm twisting, okay? For the uh, weaker countries, they, they are, you know, all the time, um, you know, threatened with, you know, many, in many ways. Now, aside from that, of course, we have uh, a, the other issue that I have already mentioned, the, fa the fact that the power uh, is given to different organizations depending on the, on the, uh, uh, on the influence that industrial countries have, and particularly major industrial countries have. And you have the gaps and imbalances in the agenda that also reflect the, uh, uh, the influence of different countries. So in certain areas, there's simply no organization uh, to, you know, to take decisions, and the decisions are totally under the purview uh, of the more powerful countries. And finally, in this structure, there is the, the, an essential counterpart which are the mechanisms uh, uh, of, by which developing countries organize to try to influence decisions in the different organizations. Now, this, uh, these organs are uh, of different character and have a long history behind them, uh, but I, I will just mention them. The, uh, in the UN, it's called the Group of 77, uh, which uh, since uh, China is not a member of the group but always votes with the group, uh, it's called the Group of 77 and China, okay? Um, now, uh, so China is large enough to, to make itself, uh, it's actually uh, it's called the group of 77 because there were originally 77 members, but now has like 130 members. <laughs> and so it's uh, much larger than the name indicates. So this is the overwhelming majority of UN members. It's the, the group that tries to get, generate consensus among developing countries for UN decisions. And, um, and, uh, and when the group of 77 is in favor of some decision, it's very difficult to defeat it. It's impossible, really. Okay? 
So the, a lot of the uh, of negotiations in the UN are negotiations between the group of 77 and major uh, grouping of industrial countries, particularly the European Union and the United States. Okay? Uh, the, Uni the European Union being a grouping of countries is generally more um, agreeable to the negotiating as a group, uh, while the U.S. Uh, is a bit more reluctant, let's say, in, the, in practice to, to do that. And then you have the group of 24. The group of 24 is less known, uh, but uh, it's a very important uh, a, a grouping in the Bretton Woods institutions. Again, China is not a member, so, but uh, China always attends the meetings of the group of 20, 24, so you could uh, men, uh, talk of the group of 24 and China. Uh, but the group of 24, uh, is a, it, it does have 24 members. Uh, I had the opportunity to participate because my country, Colombia, is actually a member of one of the 24. And uh, it's, a, it's a major grouping where developing countries get together to discuss uh, issues uh, of reforms of the IMF and the World Bank. Okay? And then there's uh, these emerging ad hoc groupings that, you know, many of which I mentioned, for instance, the WTO groupings of the ACP, the uh, least developed, the uh, the cotton producer, the group of 20 in the WTO. But you can also think of, of groupings of that sort arising in the UN, um, and some cases also in the Bretton Woods institution, but more commonly in the uh, in, uh, UN process. Now, what does it imply in terms of, of thinking you know, of um, what are the major issues uh, that, that relate to, the, um, to how you build a better uh, architecture? Um, I, I would say that the, uh, the four major issues that I can think of um, are the, um, the reforms of the Bretton Woods institutions, which have been at the center uh, of uh, debates uh, in recent years, actually, uh, particularly since the uh, Asian crisis of 1987. Uh, so the, uh, the, the basic point is these institutions that are, you know, in a sense, the center of international economic cooperation uh, have to have a better representation of developing countries. So I've been at the center, plus other uh, reforms that are important. Uh, for instance, there is the tradition uh, that the head of the IMF uh, is a European and the head of the World Bank is an American, okay? Which in practice means that the head of the World Bank is, uh, is really selected by the US president not quite the best system for an international organization, okay? Uh, to elect uh, the head of a, okay? And the, and, the Europe, and the head of the IMF is really, uh, let's say, selected by the meeting of ministers of finance of Europe. Uh, again, not the best system uh, to guarantee representation or, or even capacity uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the head to, uh, to, to do the job. Now, the second issue uh, is the how you, uh, you know, in this very uh, decentralized structure, how you uh, create a, a representative institution at the apex of the system, okay? So the head of, of, the, of the organizations, the coordinator of those organizations. The third one is what I call a denser multilayers architecture. Now, what I'm going to argue in that regard is that a system in which you have more regional organizations together with global organizations is likely to be a system that facilitates the voice of smaller countries and is therefore a, a better structure than a system that relies exclusively on global institutions that by the nature are more controlled by the major powers. Okay? And finally, there is the, uh, the implications uh, of emerging powers uh, upon uh, this uh, system. So in the case of the Bretton Woods Institution, uh, the, uh, the major issue that had been uh, discussed um, you know, over many years and that interestingly took a major step forward uh, with the reform that was approved at the end of last year uh, in the IMF uh, and prior to that in the World Bank um, in, in the case of the IMF, approved after the Group of 20 meeting in Seoul, okay? Now, what are the essential problems of, of, um, of the Bretton Woods institution? They have the overrepresentation of Europe 
and essentially the underrepresentation of Asian developing countries. Okay, so the, that it has been uh, the center, let's say, of the uh, of the reform uh, effort. But equally, the the fact that uh, that there are some countries uh, that have a guaranteed seat, and in fact they will under any circumstance, but then they are selected according to different systems. So. Um, and the, the agreement that was again reached in Seoul, in the group of 20, is that all seats will be elected. Of course, there are some countries that have enough voting power to elect themselves, but they will be not designed to sit. They have to be elected still by, you know, uh, through uh, uh, the same process that everyone is elected. So the U.S. will always be elected <laughs> because it has enough voting power to be elected. But it would not be the sign, uh, you know, a priori that it would be sit on the on the table. Um, uh, in the case of the major European powers, they would also be elected, but now it's more complex because some of them do not have enough voting power uh, to be elected by themselves. So they they will have to form a little constituency uh, to be elected now. Now there are other issues. Uh, First of all, the, uh, the 85 majority rule in the IMF, which gives the U.S. veto power. So there have been uh, many proposals to eliminate that veto power by uh, uh, reducing the threshold to, let's say, 75 percent, so that uh, no individual country will have veto power. Uh, still, you know, uh, uh, you can block, uh, I mean, a grouping of countries uh, with more than 15 percent can also block decisions in the IMF. And actually, some did after the Asian crisis. Uh, some some a grouping of developing countries uh, was put that blocked certain decisions of the IMF. But generally, uh, it is the U.S. historically that has blocked decisions uh, uh, based on this rule, and that's why the, the all the proposals are that that the uh, it should be uh, uh, eliminated or it should be reduced. The threshold should be reduced. Then the. Uh, the, the, the election of the IMF managing director and the World Bank should be by election, uh, by open election, uh, and that any citizen uh, of any of the member states can be elected uh, to the board, okay, uh, to the excuse me, to the head, to head the organization, so that we will eliminate the uh, the tradition of having always an American as head of the World Bank and always a European as the head of the IMF. Uh, and then there are a lot of things about the division of labor between uh, the boards and the administration that I'm, I'm going to skip. So this is, the, this, this is what was decided uh, in relation to the IMF. Um, it, it was decided that uh, to shift uh, essentially, uh, a, you know, a, a, this is the quotas, a, a sli slightly more than 4% of, um, of the quota uh, of the, of the I call the European G G7, G10. Uh, uh, that is a grouping that includes uh, the large European countries. That is uh, uh, Great Britain, France, Germany, and Italy, uh, but also includes some of the small uh, European countries that had a, an overwhelming uh, a, a quota and voting power in the IMF, which are Belgium, um, uh, Belgium, uh, Switzerland, and Sweden. Okay. Uh, so those countries lost 4% that was shifted essentially to developing countries. But actually, in the developing country group, there was a huge redistribution of quotas, uh, with China by itself gaining 3.4% uh, of voting power, and other winners, which are five countries, uh, Korea, um, uh, uh, Brazil, India, um, uh, Turkey, and... Um, well, another one that skipped my mind now, that won 3.9%. Uh, but so there was a large grouping of developing countries that lost in the reform, 3.4. In the in the case of uh, of voice of uh, uh, reflected by votes, uh, actually the reform was more favorable to developing countries, uh, basically because the IMF has uh, a little element of one country, one vote. Uh, which is what is called the basic votes, um, so they are given to each country according, you know, by by its membership, uh, independently of its quota. Uh, so that uh, element uh, which was triple, so 
so that the share of those basic votes wa was increased, uh, allowed uh, developing countries to win 5.3%. As you see, that the losses now of, uh, of developing countries are, uh, or the losers are relatively small. And actually, uh, you see at the end this little thing that called uh, uh, L, you know, low income countries, which actually lost a bit in the, in the uh, quota, but gained a bit uh, in the votes, thanks to that principle of the basic votes. So this, I think this was a very important reform. You can still say that, you know, that the uh, developing countries to continue to have a minority after this reform, let's say they will now, you know, broadly speaking, have something like 45% of the votes, rather than 40%. So it's still a minority of the voting power uh, in the hands of, of the countries. But this is uh, of developing countries, uh, which are the majority of members. Uh, but it's still, uh, it's, a, it's a major step forward in terms of, of of an agreement to uh, increase the voice of developing countries in the Bretton Woods situation. There was similarly uh, an effort done in the, in the World Bank um, that increased the voting uh, power of developing countries to 47%, so a bit more than the IMF. Um, and there was the uh, promise to a, a, a reach 50% in a, in a, in a very soon, so that we have equal voting power in the World Bank um, and with the still minority of developing countries in the IMF. Now, the, the basic institutional issue in my view, however, is the APEX, or, the Apex organization. Who, who is going to be at the top? Now, in that regard, um, uh, you can say that traditionally group of seven has played that role, uh, and now uh, it's done by the group of 20. So this is the realm dominated by what I call elite multilateralism, by major groupings of countries that take um, the, uh, the, the, have the power. Now, the, the group of 20, uh, which is the, the one that uh, has been uh, played a role in uh, the last three years, it has done a lot of good. I mean, I think the, uh, without the leadership exercise of the group of 20, it's difficult to think uh, you know, how the, um, this uh, global financial crisis would have been managed. Um, I still think that you know, if they have decided, the same grouping of countries have decided to do it through uh, the IMF, they would essentially have done the same. Uh, but again, they're reluctant to do that. Uh, and perhaps even more importantly, the group of 20, as it was uh, designed uh, three years ago, is a group of leaders, not a group of finance ministers. Uh, and I think that has made a difference because it's uh, the influence of leaders that has uh, led to action uh, while perhaps a uh, the ministers of finance will have not made uh, the decisions with the speed that, the, uh, that was demanded. So I would say the, the group of 20 represents an advance over the group of seven, uh, but it's still a self-appointed ad hoc body that uh, in that, in that uh, regard has a problem of representation, a serious problem of representation. So um, as is sometimes said in the uh, in the, uh, the UN debates, but you can equally say that in the, um, um, in, uh, in the IMF or the World Bank, you know, those of us who belong to the group of 172, uh, say those excluded from the group of 20, you know, are totally excluded from the major decisions. Okay? Um, now, that generates actually some awkward relation with existing uh, multilateral institutions. And I, I will make the example of the IMF, which is actually the best. Why is it the best? Because the IMF was the institution that was most favored by the group of 20. You see the list of decisions to reinforce institutions, uh, to uh, agree on its governance reform. The IMF was the, has been at the center of decisions for the group of 20. Now, at the same time, it has weakened the IMF governance structure in two significant ways. First of all, because, because the IMF board has become a, an, a, an institution that simply rubber stamps the decisions of the group of 20. So it has no power of its own. It's simply you know, ratifying what has been decided by the group of 20. 
that you say, oh, it's okay. You know, those are the 20 most powerful countries. They have, you know, whatever, you know, 80% of world GDP, you know, they have the right to decide. Okay, so I agree, you know, that's correct. But at the same time, and this is the second problem, it has really undermined the other principle of IMF governance, which are constituencies. Okay? That, you know, countries in the board represent constituencies. No, they don't represent themselves. Okay? And look at, you know, let me exemplify this uh, with the case of the constituency which my country belongs, which is the constituency of Brazil, led by Brazil, okay? So Brazil in the IMF board represents a grouping of countries, including mine, okay? And the Philippines, okay? And others, okay? When it goes to the group of 20, it does not represent us. It represents itself. So the, so the decisions of the group of 20 taken with the vote of Brazil are decisions that will be accepted by the group of 20 in which the Brazil will vote in the name of whom? In the name of itself or the constituency that it represents. So it really has ended up destroying the constituency system of the IMF. So I think the, uh, you know, that, that's why I think the group of 20 really uh, requires serious, serious thinking from the point of view of international governance. So what we would like to have, I mean, people like me would like to have, is a governance structure uh, that has, in a sense, the, uh, the powerful country sitting down at the table because otherwise it would be an irrelevant body, but at the same time representing Everyone, <laughs> uh, so that everyone is represented. In a sense, much like all parliaments are made up. Okay? So it's not everyone that is sitting, but you, know, but you have a representation system that is acceptable to all, right? So, so uh, and that's why you know, the, the several the decisions, the several proposals that have been uh, made uh, are in that direction. Um, so, uh, the, um, actually there was a, a commission uh, that was created by the President of the General Assembly in 2009 that was headed by Professor uh, Joseph Stiglitz, that, uh, which I was a member, that proposed a reform of something called the Global Economic uh, Cooperation Council uh, that is also a, 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 a of heads of state, but meets, uh, a, but has two characteristics. Uh, First is based on constituencies, so that everyone will be in, at least indirectly represented uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in that coordination organ. But it's also supported by, uh, by the UN system, not the UN organization. This is a, a little detail, but you know, remember in, the, in this uh, heterogeneous and decentralized structure, uh, the UN uh, is one part but the specialized agencies, and very importantly in this case, the IMF and the World Bank are also part of the system. And you cannot think of any relevant economic cooperation that does not have the IMF and, and the World Bank uh, as members or as supporting organizations of that uh, council. And also, very importantly, WTO. So you cannot think of anything that doesn't have WTO. So we propose a, a, this council uh, to be uh, supported by five organizations, which are the UN, WTO, I, uh, IMF, World Bank, and the International Labor Organization. Okay. okay. Now, that doesn't, uh, so that, that would be supported by the UN system, not by the UN organization. So not by the UN of New York, but rather by the system of decentralized organizations that are uh, the, the, uh, the UN in the broader sense of the term. Now, Aside from that, you can think of the UN playing very important roles in terms of decision or discussion of uh, uh, which the UN has always been very productive in bringing new issues into the agenda in a very participatory manner, including a lot of civil society participation. So you can think of the, the UN being used, uh, now the New York UN, let's say, uh, as being used for, for the broader purposes of, uh, a, of uh, a building the agenda. Now, the, the uh, multi-layer um, architecture, uh, I, I think is important basically uh, uh, to give a stronger voice to smaller countries. 
Um, it's also, I think, uh, has a certain virtues from the point of view of the stability of the international system. My basic idea here is that a system that relies exclusively on global organizations, first of all, misses a lot of issues because many of the issues are regional in character than global, than, rather than global in character. I mean, last year, the decision to create the, fin the uh, European Stabilization Fund uh, really showed that some of the problems were regional in character. So you, you have to have strong regional organizations uh, that complement the global organization. So the European Stability Fund is a complement to the IMF, but it's different from the IMF. The Asians were creating an organization of a similar character called the Chiang Mai Initiative made of uh, you know, uh, Japan, China, um, Korea, um, North, uh, excuse me, the Republic of Korea, South Korea, uh, and the ASEAN countries, okay? Uh, that's a similar sort of um, uh, Asian monetary fund, let's say, uh, that was being created. That is structure, I think, at the end of the day, is going to be better for global financial stability than just relying on one global organization. But aside from that, uh, it does give a, a voice to countries that otherwise would not have. And you can think of uh, you know, the, the best case uh, of that, which is the system of multilateral development banks, which is a structure such as the one I, I, I think uh, will be appropriate. The, uh, uh, then you have the World Bank, where you have the regional development banks, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank. Um, and you have sub-regional banks, for instance, the, uh, the Andean Development Corporation, uh, the, the Central American Bank for Integration and Development, uh, and then you have the, um, the Caribbean Development Bank in the Americas. Okay? So that system um, it does give voice to, to smaller countries that would otherwise uh, have very weak voice in the global organization. So the, the more dense the system is in terms of regional organizations, the more participation of the smaller countries you will have in the system. And finally, you know, you know, this is more speculative, but you know, what are the implications of rising uh, of emerging powers? Well, directly it brings developing countries into, uh, in, into the power structure in a very significant way. Because, I mean, to start with, you're bringing China, you have India, Brazil, South Africa, etc. Into the, um, into the game. And this has a, a created opportunity for all the developing countries which they value. I mean, go to any meeting on Africa, today of, or rather of African countries, and you see the very important role uh, that the relations with China play today. And, uh, and the fact that China is giving more, uh, is lending more money to developing countries than the World Bank is the strongest reflection of that fact. But China is also the major market for many developing countries, not only of Africa, and actually Latin America. They are uh, in, South Amer in, the, is, in South America, uh, China is now number two or number two trading partner for most of the South American countries. So it has a significant uh, change uh, in international relations. But very few of these countries are really building global alliances. And there is, for instance, a huge difference in that regard uh, between China and India. China is building an international system of alliances. Uh, India has not invested enough in doing that. And you can say in some cases, the, uh, like Brazil, Brazil is not, um, uh, has not even invested enough in building a, a Latin American uh, grouping uh, behind it. So the, it is really China that is uh, uh, rising as the real alternative power uh, so that uh, rather than having a system uh, with many major powers, the one that I, 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 I'm foreseeing is one in which China uh, has the, uh, the dominant role uh, in that regard. So the, I, I, uh, I will end up with a question. Uh, I'm not totally sure that this uh, is going to facilitate broader uh, voice of developing countries. I think that's, uh, that emergence by itself, of course, will lead a strong voice to some developing countries, but it's unclear whether the broader group of developing countries will be favored by that decision. 
uh, even though they may be favored by some of the uh, actions of those countries, particularly of China. <coughs> but that at the end of the day, the competition among powers has always been good for developing countries. And, um, uh, and, uh, and I think that is, uh, uh, I will end with that note, that a system that in which you know, powers have to compete among, among each other has always been good for the, for the weaker among the countries of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions. We have a microphone circulating, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait till the mic reaches you so that we can all hear your question. Um, and we'd like to get questions from students first, if possible. Um, so students, raise your hands. Ever since uh, the Copenhagen Climate Conference, some people have been saying that there should actually be fewer countries at the table so that a binding climate treaty can actually get um, be executed. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good question. I actually, um, think of the way, uh, it, what I find unacceptable is the principle that because uh, you have to have the major uh, countries uh, taking major decisions. <laughs> um, uh, that means that you have to exclude uh, others. So you can still have the, the broad, I mean, first of all, to have the, the uh, United Framework Convention on Climate Change as the uh, place where decisions will be made. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, uh, as in any parliament, because this is a parliament, right, that is taking decisions and is approving laws, let's say. Uh, you know, the way, you know, negotiations take place may involve fewer, uh, uh, fewer or, uh, uh, players, let's say. So in the U.S. Congress, it's not always the 100 senators that are taking decisions. It's really, uh, the, the, you know, there is a, a negotiation process that involves fewer of them but then the fewer of them have to bring the thing and discuss the, the, the agenda with the broader group, with the, large, well, with the whole group. That's something that, uh, so that it's much better if you use the, the uh, arrangement to negotiate, try, try to change the, the arrangement to negotiate. Uh, I think the big mistake of Copenhagen was exactly that they tried to uh, create a substitute for the broader negotiation. And I don't think it was a success. Uh, while actually the more recent mo uh, meeting in Cancun, which was more, more su much su more successful in its outcome in trying to push the agenda, uh, you know, really respected the rules of the game. Uh, and in all, by the way, in all those arrangements uh, of negotiating, uh, you know, among the most powerful, uh, always the head of the negotiations is critical, um, and it's generally. Uh, agreed that the uh, the Mexican authorities were very good at doing that and trying to consult with the major powers the uh, the agreements uh, rather than uh, try to uh, uh, to replace them which was the uh, you know a criticism that's generally made uh, of the uh, Danish uh, share of the Copenhagen summit so you, you have the of course negotiation is one thing but the decisions really have to respect the, uh, the parliament that is taking them. Back in the 1980s, the U.S. sort of woke up to the fact that in the General Assembly, they, we were paying 25% of the budget, but only had about 2% um, of, the, of the vote we combined with other developed countries and that the third world had paid about three or four percent of the budget and had 95 percent of the vote and they were pushing through the the uh, budget on that basis and so the u.s started to withhold its contributions and voted against virtually every uh, resolution that had financial implications where there were add-ons to the budget um my question is uh, you're you're arguing and very well, I think, for um, for 
a greater say on the part of the developing countries. But what should be, if any, the relationship between the financial contribution and the amount of the vote or the power that these countries have in any of these organizations? Uh, you, you would not imagine how inconsistent countries are in the, on, on this issue. Um, uh, <laughs> one of the things I learned, uh, you know, uh, when I had to uh, estimate the um, certain parameters for the negotiations of the UN budget, is that the criteria used by the U.S. and, let's say, and developing countries are actually inconsistent uh, in the UN to what they do uh, in, the, in the IMF, okay? And I'll explain. <laughs> in the, I mean, in one of the uh, measures that is, is gross domestic product, right? The, you know, the size of the economies. But you know, there are traditionally two ways of estimating the uh, the size of economies. Where you know, you can estimate that market prices, or you can estimate something called purchasing power parities. Mm -hmm. The purchasing power parities are estimated based on the cost of living. So you adjust by the cost of living. So since developing countries have a lower cost of living, uh, the, um, uh, you adjust their gross domestic product up. So the, let's say the Chinese GDP is much larger at purchasing power parities than at market price, OK? Very funny, uh, when they negotiate in the IMF, the industrial countries have always said, no, market prices is what matters, right? <laughs> But when they go to the, uh, the UN, they say, no, it's purchase of power part. <laughs> so, uh, so that China will pay more. Uh, um, in the, but, but it's very funny because you, the developing countries have exactly the, uh, the same inconsistency. So China will argue for purchase of power parties in the IMF and will argue for market prices in the UN. So you, you, know, you will not find a lot of consistency in this negotiation. Now, Saying that, uh, I, I think uh, the, um, uh, the bo I mean, you can design it, and, and uh, you know, the, the system is designed in some cases by, you know, how much, uh, you know, you contribute uh, gives you uh, how much voting power you have. That's what I call the one dollar, one vote system. Uh, or you can design the system as uh, based on you know, the uh, membership, okay? The one country, one vote. And, you know, uh, there are many ways, and uh, you have intermediate solutions, let's say, you can think of. Um, but, but then, uh, of course, budgets have to be uh, always uh, based on, on capacity to finance the, the budget. Now, uh, yes, there, there, are, there may be inconsistencies uh, but they actually are every day's uh, inconsistencies. Uh, let's say, uh, let's just take the example of U.S. Congress. Okay, so, so New York and California have the same vote as New Hampshire, uh, which is much smaller, let's say. Uh, but uh, uh, would you argue then that, the, that you should change the, uh, the contribution so that New Hampshire has to contribute as much to the federal budget uh, as uh, New York or California, uh, or alternatively change the U.S. Senate so that it is, is more like the, sh the, uh, the chamber of representatives so that it's really uh, the, the population that matters for that purpose. Now, you have historically agreed <laughs> on a different rule that each state has two senators. No, which is a, a, a good as good as any other, but it's still the federal budget is financed according to the economic power. So this, the income tax, they say, of citizens, so that the, um, let's say, a resident of New York like me will have to contribute more to the federal budget uh, or the, the collection of uh, taxpayers of New York uh, will have to pay more of the U.S. budget than the taxpayers of New Hampshire. I think it's a good system. I mean, the, despite that it, it, it does, in fact, not reflect the, uh, you know, not lead to, uh, to the principle of one vote, uh, one uh, dollar, one vote. So the, it's not always correct to say that that's a better system. In, in, pra in the practice, you, you know, as you know, the, the history of this uh, led to, uh, to a capping of the U.S. contribution to the, to the U.N. 
which I think was an acceptable solution. So I, 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 as far as I can see, um, yeah, the, I, I think it's, it, it was correct that the, the U.S. was overpaying uh, in the U.N. budget, and that was corrected. So that I think it's capped now at something like 20 percent, uh, uh, which is uh, more or less what is probably correct. Um, because you know, like look at the IMF, it's 18 percent of voting power, so it's more or less equivalent to the size of the U.S. in the world economy. So I think you know you have to be pragmatic about the solutions, but do not always defend the principle of one dollar, one vote, because you will not be willing always to defend that principle. Okay. <laughs>